just uh, I will just mute and I suggest that everybody mutes and we will just turn on our uh, microphones whenever we want to speak. Otherwise, uh, it, it's become chaotic. Okay. Okay, great. Th thank you, thank so, you much. so much. John. Thank you, John. Thank you. And as we get started, I, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to, to Drs. Klopsis and Petropoulos for allowing me uh, to zoom in with you this afternoon. It's a true honor and privilege uh, to be able to spend time with you, and I'm looking forward to our time together. Uh, if you do have questions throughout, you can feel free to ask uh, as I, I, uh, I lecture, or if you want to wait to the end, um, or both, that, that is fine as well. So, uh, as, as uh, Professor Klopsis mentioned, that th today's uh, discussion will be on uh, the UN Security Council's permanent member uh, perspectives. And here on the slide, you'll see we've got the flags of China, France, Russia, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Uh, these are permanent members of the Security Council. And there are actually 10 other members that also make up the Security Council every three years. So three will rotate off, then another three, and then four. And other nations have a chance to as well. One of the other things that I'll say as to why the Security Council is so important is it is the only component of the United Nations that can actually set binding resolution. And it requires at least nine affirmative votes uh, and no veto from any single permanent member of the Security Council. So really a lot of the power resides with the permanent members because if they decide, any nation decides to veto a resolution, then it will not go forward. So I'll cover some background. And I'll pro provide some context as to why this is important. And I'll say that when leaders make decisions, uh, the, incomes, the outcomes can be quite profound. Uh, what do we mean by this? Well, because we live in a globalized setting, um, uh, decisions that a country can make, for example, Greece, uh, as a member of the European Union could have impacts on other nations within the European Union. Uh, and what world leaders need to understand is that there can be unintended secondary and what we call tertiary effects. So it's not just I take a decision on a particular issue, but what does this mean and what else does this mean uh, going forward? And some of those secondary and tertiary effects can be good and they can be bad. So we, we need to really uh, get into the mindset of trying to figure out what can take place and what, what might end up happening. Uh, the UN has ex uh, undergone extensive changes over the years, and most notably, when it comes to issues of terrorism, uh, the UN has been able to act quite uh, responsibly and has been able to look to put into place measures to help uh, counter the effects of terrorism to include uh, the Islamic t State as well as others. And another example, in recent years that showcased the success was the Iranian nuclear agreement back in 2015. Here we had the five permanent members of the Security Council plus Germany. Uh, Germany really took the, the, the lead on this in bringing the nations together and understanding that a nuclear armed uh, Iran was not in the best interest of, of, uh, of, of the world community. Uh, especially f due to the instability that we often see in the Middle East. And all five of the permanent members were in agreement that a nuclear arm, uh, Iran was bad and came on board to agree to the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action uh, in exchange for lifting of sanctions against Iran. Iran agreed to no longer uh, enrich uranium to a level that was approaching that that could be weaponized. Now, just because we had agreements from the United Nations on this one issue does not necessarily translate into agreements with other areas. And if we travel back to Europe, for example, uh, and what we've seen in 2015 going forward is that Russia has been involved in a lot of activity uh, towards its west, you know, with the annexation of Crimea 
and the subsequent involvement of in the in the political apparatus of Ukraine and its conduct of hybrid warfare in Ukraine uh, to the dissatisfaction of uh, European countries to include Greece uh, and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and the other permanent members we've got uh, we've got the United States, the United Kingdom, and France not happy with what Russia is doing, and China is basically on the sidelines here. So again, we needed all five for Iran, but in Europe, there's issues going on where we, we have uh, problems, and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization has actually countered Russia by deploying what we call these enhanced forward presence brigades in the countries of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland. Uh, as we continue to travel eastward, uh, we then find ourselves in, um, in China. And China has been involved in a lot of different things with regards to cyberspace, uh, the South China Sea, and is considered a lifeline to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, otherwise known as North Korea. And we'll get into this in more detail as well. Uh, and then finally, if we circle back to the Middle East, again, we needed the five members to work together with regards to uh, with Iran, but in the country of Syria, we have the US, uh, France and the UK involved in, let's say a counter air campaign against uh, Islamic State targets in the country of Syria. Ostensibly, Russia deployed to Sir Syria also to participate in the uh, counter Islamic State activities, but they have also been there to protect Bashar al-Assad and the leadership of Syria to the consternation of the United States, France, and the United Kingdom. And we'll get into this in more detail in a little bit. Moving on, I wanna focus on the research questions that I studied. Uh, and oh, by the way, that this is, I should have said this at the outset, that this is uh, in relation to a book that I had that came out on the UN Security Council permanent members back in 2019. So I looked at uh, three questions. The first deals with how, the second one why, and the third, you know, what are the implications for the US? With the how and why, I looked at four instruments of national power, and I'll cover these in a little bit, but the, the acronym stands for DIME, which is Diplomacy, Information, Military, and Economic Means. Uh, when moving on to the research methodology, uh, this is a qualitative research study. That is, it is non-numerical based. Uh, I, I don't use, you know, for example, linear stepwise regression or z-scores or, or uh, chi-squares, et cetera. Uh, I focus solely on secondary data because there is an awful lot of data available out there and I'll cover this in one of the models that I use to assist me in acquiring the information. Uh, the two models I used are the Yerdom M, which is the Yurk Intelligence Red Team model modified, and the Federal Secondary Data Case Study Yerdum Triangulation M. model. And I actually have two slides, the next two slides address the two models, so I'll co cover more detail on these in just a minute. And then really what I started with was a meta-analysis that is looking at keywords. And I would use uh, these keywords in order to enter into databases like, you know, scholarly library databases, uh, Google Scholar, looking at uh, the libraries of the United Nations and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, looking at what the European Union had available to it, uh, et cetera, in, in order to gather the sources from which I used as data to conduct the analysis. Uh, the limitations, uh, I focused oh, on a five-year oh, period from 2015 through 2019, mm -hmm. so nothing really before that. And once again, because it was secondary data focused, yeah. I did not include questionnaires, interviews, or surveys. So one of the fine, one of the uh, the recommendations I have okay. at the end of my book is that if others wanted to conduct, you know, further studies, that they could use primary research techniques in order to an either refute or confirm and perhaps enhance what I've already found. And again, I only focused on open source data. Uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Klopsis mentioned that I used to work for the intelligence community. There of course is uh, you know, well, classified data out well, there on these well, countries, well, we, we did not include them <laughs> in the study. 
Okay, the first model that I used is the York Intelligence Red T model. And again, along the, uh, the sort of the center left there, you'll see focused diplomacy, targeted information, military capabilities, and economic uh, pressure as a way for a country to shape an outcome ultimately to either maintain or enhance their position in the world. And again, I looked at this primarily through the lens of the four other non-US members of the Security Council in order to basically make sense of what's going on. And again, there are other variables that one could use, but I only focused on diplomacy, information, military and economic means from which to conduct the study. Uh, moving on, I, in order to strike a balance in secondary data, I used uh, this model, the Federal Secondary Data Case Study Triangulation Model. Uh, at the top and the bottom left, you'll see more of a written uh, component. So I looked at various plans and systems. For example, uh, I looked at cybersecurity plan of the different countries. I looked at you know, the weapon systems available for from the other permanent Security Council member perspectives. And then I conducted an assessment of those. To the bottom left, I looked at documents, legislation, and policy. And this also included things like peer reviewed journal articles, it included books, it included government reports, and from reports from supranational organizations like NATO, like the United Nations, et cetera. And then if you look to the right, the bottom right, this is more of an oral account to better understand what's going on. So I looked at what are the official press releases coming out of the different countries? You know, what testimony uh, perhaps has the UK prime minister presented to um, uh, parliament? Uh, what about televised interviews? You know, what, what, were, uh, what was exchanged? What was the messaging that was taking place and biographical accounts as well? All of this look to kind of synthesize things and to triangulate in on results. So to provide some context, um, this is Antonio uh, Guterres, the, the current uh, UN Secret Secretary General. Um, there are several organs. This is just a fancy word for sections that make up the United Nations. The Trustee Council was actually disbanded in 1994. And the two most important ones that we'll spend time with today really are the General Assembly, which is where all nations in the world basically uh, get a voice. And in September of each year, the United Nations meets and all world leaders have a chance generally, except for this year because of COVID, to come to New York physically and present their priorities and their, their issues uh, to the General Assembly. And then more pointedly, we'll look at the Security Council and more specifically, the uh, five permanent members uh, that, that make it up. Um, I'm gonna cover briefly the, the US priorities because I think it's important contextually to understand what's going on. Uh, these date back to the latest national security strategy, which is a bit dated, goes back to 2017, but I'll cover a couple things that President Biden who just took office um, in January in our country uh, what he will probably build on. Most likely he will continue to focus on these priorities, but he's gonna build on, on these as well. So when we look at Homeland, uh, that's job number one. I would submit to you that Greece and all other countries will always focus first and foremost on their own country before they look at global engagement. And we look at energy specifically moving off of dependency of, you know, of foreign, uh, petroleum and, and gas, finance and banking, uh, making sure that we've got uh, network security to prevent hackers from moving in and, and working against our finance and banking system, uh, safety and health to include such issues as uh, pandemics and, uh, and, 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 and uh, transmittable diseases, and then communications and transportation from which to foster the sharing of information and the ability to move goods and services throughout the country. And this includes such things as ports, airports, roads, bridges, tunnels, et cetera. Uh, all of this should lead to prosperity and we'll kind of underscore how, you know, especially one country, China is eroding US influence in the world because of its rise in economic status. Peace through strength abroad looks at, again, forward military presence and basing 
uh, in order to project power and influence abroad, advancing American cultural influence, you know, democ uh, promoting de democracy and free elections, and then soft versus hard power. How do we go about doing that? Well, soft power focuses mostly on diplomatic means and engagement, and then hard power looks at uh, perhaps using the military instrument of power in order to uh, cajole countries in order to change their behavior. Uh, China, so this brings us to the analysis of, of the first real actor here. So in terms of population, it is ranked number one in the world. It is the largest country, uh, though India is also showing itself to be quite prominent and has an extremely large population as well. So it's got the second largest population in the world. But focusing on China, uh, it's number one in terms of population, and it is ranked second in the world in terms of the gross domestic product, okay? Uh, so it is very powerful and will underscore just how rapidly it's growing when we come down to the economic instrument. So it has emerged as a significant global actor on the world stage in recent years. And I'll basically say that my country uh, failed to uh, properly understand what was going on with this in other countries because we were so focused uh, for about 15 years following the 9-11 attacks, orienting ourselves only around the topic of terrorism that we didn't see how quickly countries like Russia and China and others were rising in prominence in the world. And we've actually recently assessed China as being our number one threat above all other things. For years, it was terrorism. Now it's clearly China, followed by Russia, followed by cyber. Uh, but but we, we've got some challenges kind of moving forward with this. So let's look at the four instruments of national power and what is uh, taking place around the world. Uh, and specifically, we'll look at China and diplomatically, uh, China's pushed the world to convince us uh, that its intentions, both regionally and globally, are essentially benign. Um, but what we have seen in recent years is that they have actually engaged in some pretty strategic initiatives. So they have been able to, uh, for example, as part of their Belt and Roads Initiative, they've been moving um, uh, into other, even other continents like Africa. And in exchange for providing loans for development, what we have seen is that if countries start to default on those loans, that they look in exchange for forgiving that debt to be allowed at a time and place of their choosing in order to use or have access to the airfields and seaports in those countries. And we anticipate that that is to project their military power if they choose to do so. So diplomatically, that's sort of what they are engaged in. And they are considered a lifeline to North Korea. So um, the reclusive regime of uh, Kim Jong-un is a concern to the United States. And we see China as wanting to help keep that country afloat, if for no other purpose, because we have roughly 20,000 US troops uh, to the south in the in the People's Republic of Korea, um, uh, or the, 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 the I'm sorry, the Republic of Korea, South Korea, and they want to basically have a buffer zone between uh, the U.S. and China. So they will continue to uh, be the big brother to North Korea, and diplomatically will try to keep its relationship extremely strong with this country. Uh, informationally, it has been very uh, skilled at uh, using cyber in order to steal secrets. Um, it has been very, very effective in doing this uh, as early as uh, the late 1990s. And there was something called the Cox Report that showed how China was able to st uh, steal uh, classified information on the U.S. nuclear weapons program. And, and the assessment was that they actually acquired data on every type of nuclear warhead that we had uh, that had available. Uh, informationally, also, uh, they have been targeting uh, U.S. Uh, finance and defense uh, tech sectors. Uh, recently, we've seen the hack of, of Google and Gmail. 
And there have been 34 other incidents where they have used cyber in order to uh, hack into uh, Yahoo. Um, Semantic, which is a major uh, antivirus program to figure out the codes that we look for to see if they can reverse engineer their malware to work around the semantic software. Uh, Northrop Grumman, which is the producer of our latest stealth uh, generation, fifth generation jet fighter, and then Dow Chemicals, which is uh, an instrumental company in the production of such composite materials as Kevlar and other things in order to see what they can do to steal the technology to do that and reverse engineer it and to produce these things uh, less expensively uh, and then sell them as well. Militarily, uh, they have invested in my Blue Water Navy. Uh, they recently acquired a Russian uh, aircraft carrier and retrofitted it to its purposes and have been developing several other uh, aircraft carriers. Uh, and what's important to know, the difference between a blue water and a brown water Navy, Navy is a country like Greece, uh, you, uh, as an archipelago nation state, uh, you are concerned with the security of uh, the islands that make up your country. So you got a Navy in order to patrol what we call the littoral areas, pretty much going out 12 nautical miles in order to uh, protect your interests. Well, when you are investing in uh, aircraft carriers and uh, these are clearly offensive capabilities because they are very, very expensive to produce. And that tips the hand as to where we see their intentions going forward. Um, they're investing more as a percentage of GDP on the military than the US. So they have been investing roughly 8% uh, compared to the U.S. is 3.5 percent, and that in and of itself is another telltale sign that they have aspirations beyond what they are basically presenting to the world. So even though in terms of total absolute dollars, they're not spending as much uh, as the U.S., percentage-wise they are, and that is showing you know, where they might be going in the future. Uh, they're actively patrolling, uh, patrolling the South China Sea, and they've openly stated that they want to control access to the South China Sea. And why is this important? Well, 80% of the global trade by volume and 70% of the value of global trade goes by ships. 60% of the maritime trade actually transits through the Asia region and of which 30% uh, of that is actually going through the South China Sea. And one can quickly see that whoever controls the South China Sea can have significant economic sway over other countries. And then we've also seen their buildup of the Spratly and Parasol Island. You know, ostensibly this was for them to uh, monitor the environment and sea levels, but, and they were putting radar stations and runways on these islands. But the reality is, is we've now seen the military buildup and presence on these islands and they're basically changing the goalposts because if most countries see their territory extending 12 nautical miles out beyond any landmass, then they're encroaching further and further into uh, the South China Sea. And then economically, it is the second largest economy in the world. Uh, they recently, in uh, recent years, have sustained double digit growth as compared to the US at about two uh, to 3%. And if you just look mathematically, over time, it's just a point of time at which China will actually surpass the U.S. And there are actually economists that are predicting that within the next 15 years, China could surpass the United States as the most powerful country in the world economically. Uh, France ranks 21st in the world in terms of population, so second to last in relation to the UNSC members. And they're ranked sixth in the world, so fourth in relation to the other UNSC members in relation to GDP. Uh, diplomatically, some of the things that they have been doing is um, they basically have a two-pronged approach, uh, one of which is trying to endear itself to other European countries in the European Union as the United Kingdom looks to move out of the European Union. Uh, and it has been looking to, and to basically fill the power vacuum. So 
Germany's number one. They want to be the number two in the European Union. And they've been reaching out to the United States to engage with my country to see what it can do to enhance uh, trade through diplomacy. We can get to that in a little bit later as well. Uh, informationally, I'll just underscore a couple points here that um, uh, uh, of the three Western aligned countries, the US, UK, and France, France actually has some of the most intrusive rules by which they can actually spy on their own citizens. But when it comes to actual action in terms of implementing, uh, let's say, counterterrorism or anti terrorism <laughs> legislation, they really haven't done a whole lot in recent years, but they still see transnational terrorism as one of its primary concerns. Militarily, um, it has uh, re-entered the military structure in NATO. It, it left, the, it was still in the political structure, but it left the military structure in the late 1960s, but returned in 2009. And since then, they have been actively involved in military operations in Afghanistan, in some of the most dangerous areas in RC East more specifically. Uh, the 2011 uh, Libyan air war and the counter ISIS air campaign in Syria. And they've also been very instrumental and, and one of the more dominant influencing countries on the con continent of Africa dealing with counterterrorism. And then economically, you know, as it uh, has moved forward from the economic downturn of 2008, uh, it's kind of sliding a little bit backwards. Uh, France has issues with the, uh, the rise of COVID cases, but it does see its position as uh, in the European Union as a way for it in order to enhance its economic position. Likewise, it is, uh, has legislation that is designed to protect uh, you know, foreign takeover of companies that have uh, linkages to France's national security. And it is probably dedicated more in terms of the, three, uh, the two other Western line countries, uh, the United States and the UK, in shoring up the protection of its financial and banking sectors to prevent it from cyber intrusion. Uh, Russia, uh, mo moving briefly on here, we've got, it's ranked uh, number 10 in the world. So right in the middle of the UNSC members in terms of population. And it places it 12 in the world uh, in terms of, of G GDP. So it comes in last place uh, in relation to the UNSC members. Uh, diplomatically, it's, it's looked at a two-prong approach. So uh, on the Central Asian side, it is engaged in diplomacy to maintain strong relations with for, former Soviet era uh, allies. And then in the Middle East, it has served as one of the points of the trifecta uh, showing strong allegiance to both Iran and to S Syria. So a lot of challenges for us there. And oh, by the way, uh, on the Western flank, you know, they, they have been engaged in issues with regards to Crimea and, uh, and Ukraine, which is why we've deployed these enhanced forward presence brigades uh, in, uh, th that I mentioned earlier with, with NATO. Informationally, it is uh, a, a two-pronged issue here. One, it is very protective of its information. It is invested quite extensively in what we call CND or computer network defense, because it doesn't want to see what happened to it that it has exerted in other countries, which is using social media as a way to garner support for causes that it believes in. And we've seen this going forward from 2016 uh, to the most recent present election where Russia has been using bots and bot replication and cyber and social media as a way to try to sway the opinion of public, the, the public of, of Western aligned countries to get candidates elected that it believes are beneficial to it. That would like, for example, remove sanctions levied against Russia. So it wants candidates that are aligned with Russia. Militarily, again, it has uh, exerted greater influence in recent years on the European continent. And what's important to note about Syria is from the time that they said that they were gonna participate in the counter-terror campaign uh, to the time that they actually went in, 
it only took them two weeks in order to do that. And they were launching combat air sorties within two weeks of them saying that they were gonna go into Syria. And they, they quickly built up an air base there. And what's important to note is that, um, that this was really the first out of area operation that Russia participated in since it was in Afghanistan <laughs> in the late 1980s. And this brings us to economic issues, which is what can China, what can Russia do? And it can basically enhance through the flow of weapons. And though its weapons are not considered as superior as Western designed and produced weapons, they do have an advantage in that they can mass produce relatively easy to maintain and very reliable weapon systems. So a lot of developing countries or poorer countries are very inclined to purchase Russian weapons technology because it is reliable and easy to maintain. And of course, uh, being one of the most powerful petroleum countries in the world, we've seen you know, the, the creation of the Nordstrom and almost creation of the Nord Stream 2 line where it can use the sale of petroleum products for the flow into Europe as a way to exert influence and in using the economic means in order to exert pressure. pressure. And then finally, we've got the United Kingdom. Uh, in terms of population, it comes in 22, so under France and in last place, uh, but it is right in the middle in terms of its GDP. Diplomatically, uh, it is looking to secure greater uh, trading rights with the US, especially as it looks to implement Brexit. Uh, and, and move out of the European Union. Uh, it is still very concerned about counterterrorism and what it can do to prevent terrorism from taking place in its country. And it is also investing in, in uh, greater foreign uh, in order to uh, negotiate an agreement that will hopefully help it from preventing it moving backwards as it moves out of Brexit. Uh, and it wants really to enhance the relation with the U.S. as well. Uh, informationally, um, whereas uh, France might be more inclined to invest in uh, technology, the U.K. is more inclined to leverage its position through the Five Eyes Nation, which are the most trusted intelligence partners with the U.S., so it includes uh, the U.S., Canada, the U.K., Australia, and New Zealand. Uh, it does see cyber as a mainstay concern, and it has been successful in implementing a cyber security strategy to mitigate from the effects of what we call CNO, computer network operations. And under that, we have two subcategories, CNE, which is computer network exploitation, and CNA, which is computer network attack. Uh, militarily, it is looking to enhance its national interests over those of its collective partners. So what do we mean by this? Well, it's in the future going to look at an issue through its own national security lens. And depending on whether or not it's in its best interest will be whether or not it wants to participate in such things, for example, NATO operations. But nevertheless, it would like to use the North Atlantic Treaty Organization as a way to share the burden in supporting some of its self-interests. And then terrorism and instability from extremism are also a primary concern. So we do, my, my prediction is that, that uh, the UK will continue to look for foreign-based threats, you know, foreign-based terror organizations and try to take them out overseas versus uh, having them uh, come home to roost in the United Kingdom. And then economically, again, uh, they are very concerned with uh, the terms of Brexit and you know, moving forward, what does that mean? And they're, they're looking to, uh, again, not fall any lower in terms of economic position in the world and are basically scrambling in order to make sure that they've got trade agreements in place that are favorable for it. So this now brings us to the research questions and the answers. So diplomatically, uh, the nations will pursue measures to help increase their prominence in the world. So all nations are going to do that. And likewise, they will continue to foster relations with countries that are aligned culturally in their ways and strengthen their relations in order to do so. And they're going to be working with 
uh, the, uh, other professionals in order to make these uh, connections uh, diplomatically in order to carry out their intent. Uh, informationally, uh, uh, information is key to help and garner support. Um, my assessment was that Russia will continue uh, to use its influence and adeptness in social media to help shift elections where possible to lend support to politicians that have leanings towards it. And Russia and China will most likely use cyber as a way to steal trade secrets, proprietary information and military blueprints uh, to reduce what we call the research and development timeline. So for countries that are investing in new technology, a lot of the cost goes into research and development uh, in order to get prototypes out there and then to put things into production. If you're able to steal that technology and compress the research development time and not spend that money, then you can better use that money to figure out how to better reverse engineer the technology to produce it cheaper and enhance your, your economic means. So, so informationally, they're gonna to continue to do that. Uh, all countries are moving in the direction that will tighten their C&D efforts, computer network defense, while mitigating the effects from other countries into future election cycles. Um, moreover, militarily, Russia and China will likely increase their expenditures relative to their gross domestic product to exert greater influence Whereas conversely, France and the United Kingdom will either maintain or might even reduce their expenditures in their military's uh, capabilities going forward. Um, uh, countries will either try to maintain or make modest increases. Um, uh, uh, looking at the economic component in order to help uh, do, do what it can in order to uh, be, become more powerful. So China will look to uh, produce things at a, a less expensive rate than the US to compete directly with them for similar products. And Russia similarly will be interested in um, its uh, export of weapons and petroleum products as well. Um, when turning to the country of, of France, uh, it is looking to fill the power vacuum as the UK moves out of the European Union and is looking at bilateral agreements in addition to leveraging the economic strengths and vitality of the European Union. And the UK conversely is really looking at more bilateral agreements and trying to strengthen the relationship with the United States. The one thing that is certain uh, is that Terrorism was a common theme that I saw that all countries agreed that terrorism was bad and all countries were in agreement that they would share information uh, to, to basically help prevent transnational uh, terror organizations from spreading their ideology around the world. Um, so terrorism is one thing. And also what I found is that China will really is looking to enhance its position on the world stage. And as a result of the US pulling out of something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, really has strengthened uh, these trade agreements with uh, countries that were originally going to join the TPP. So China has really asserted itself, not just regionally, but globally as well in doing this. And my prediction is that Russia, uh, if not globally, will definitely regionally uh, show itself as a significant actor on uh, the world stage in the years going forward. Um, why are they doing this? Well, uh, si simply stated, uh, China and, and Russia both would like the prestige associated with uh, uh, reattaining superpower status. And again, we'll use these instruments of national power in a way in order to enhance their position. Uh, so again, China uh, globally, Russia regionally, and then when turning to the countries of France and the United Kingdom, um, they are also want to maintain the prestige of their positions in the world. We'll use the instruments in order to do so, but France is looking more at a holistic uh, united front with multiple partners in the European Union, and whereas the UK is looking more at this, let's say, go it alone, uh, as it moves out of the European Union. And so what are the implications for the United States? Well, 
Uh, you heard me talk earlier that, um, you know, well, well, I didn't state this, but I, my prediction is the U.S. is a waning power. It's not if, but when. We will um, likely see another country surpass uh, the U.S. as being the most uh, influential power in the world. Uh, my prediction is that China will do this first economically, but it might be some years before they are able to uh, do this militarily. Um, likewise, depending on the strength of the, the, uh, the sale of barrels of oil are directly linked to Russia's economy. So the quicker the world is able to move uh, away from dependency on petroleum products, uh, the less powerful Russia will become because then it will only be able to revert back to its weapon sales as a way in order to really generate hard currency. And then uh, most likely we still see the UK and France as the strongest allies in the United States. But whereas we might have been able to rely on them more extensively to help us with operations like the counter Islamic State campaign, um, on the, uh, in the country of Syria, we can't necessarily rely on them in the future because of uh, the positions that they need to take and, and they're trying to maintain the, their own economic viability. So in order to make sure we've got time for questions, I'm going to end it there. And uh, I'll, I'd like to now open it up to any of you that, uh, that, that might have a question or questions for me. Uh, Professor Weaver, dear John, we are uh, very happy and we're very thankful for your uh, in-depth and uh, very analytical presentation. I have to say that uh, I teach a course which is called uh, Diplomacy in International Organization. So part of the course is actually devoted on how the United Nations uh, uh, work and its instruments and so on. So I suppose many of the students are uh, very familiar with the, okay, the whole good, process, good, good, good. and they, they they will be maybe they will have uh, uh, more detailed questions. But I will take the privilege of asking the first question actually. Sure. Uh, if if uh, if uh, if you allow me. Um, yes, of course. Okay. Uh, there has been from time to time a discussion concerning how, if and how, the Security Council should. Um, uh, change uh, its internal uh, balances, meaning if more uh, permanent members should be added or if some of the existing uh, permanent members should not uh, be permanent members. As you uh, know better than me, um, the members of the, the Security Council, uh, the um, permanent members, actually reflect uh, uh, the balance of power which uh, uh, existed in, uh, in global affairs immediately after the end of the Second World War, but many things have changed ever since. Yeah. Do you think there's a, a, a real prospect that we see sometime in the future, not in the near future, maybe in the, uh, in the distant future, some sort of uh, reshuffling in the members of the United uh, Nations Security Council? Yeah, I, I don't know. I know Germany it, it frequently pops up as one that most nations, I think, would agree, you know, due, due to their economic vitality and their, uh, their ability to lead, uh, should be a permanent member. Um, the, the issue, I think, comes into play with regards to uh, the, 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 the power of the veto that the permanent members have. And, and if it expands, then what does that mean? And for example, if you look at the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, you know, as it has expanded, um, you know, any one member in NATO could also veto. And there are those that argue that as a result of expanding that, that it has reduced the effectiveness. So I, to be honest, I, I, I don't know uh, wh whether or not it w would actually take place, but I, I would submit to you that those that are members are not going uh, to be willing to just give up their position uh, and the power that kind of goes with it. But what, 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 let me ask you this, what, what are your thoughts on this? I, 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 more or less, I agree with you. I do not think that the current uh, permanent members of the Security Council will ever agree on the granting privileges that they have for themselves to other nations. And I'm sure that uh, if, uh, 
we have more permanent members in the Security Council with uh, veto power, then um, decision making will become even more complicated and probably the Security Council will uh, find itself in front of uh, a stalemate. It would yeah. be extremely difficult, if not impossible, uh, to make any decision. I have another... Um, uh, there's another problem, I think, uh, when it comes to the expand the expansion of membership in the Security Council. For example, w one would argue that, let's say, Japan should be a member of the Security Council or India should be a member of the Security Council because, as you said, it's yeah. an important role. But if India becomes a member of the Security Council, then Pakistan will want to become a member of the Security Council, you know, because they have uh, their own in conflict. And one would argue, and I would definitely agree, that an African nation should be a member of the Security Council because no African nation is currently a permanent member. But the question then is, which of the African nations should be a member, a permanent member? Should it be South Africa? Should it be Nigeria? Should it be an Arab country? And if it is an Arab country, then you know non-Arab countries will uh, disagree, and it goes. Um, it's a vicious circle. I mean, you can have arguments and counter arguments uh, for everything. Yeah, I, 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 absolutely. Yeah, and as China, I'm sorry, as India is though, as an economic powerhouse and as the second most populated country, yeah, that, that brings up interesting dynamics. And then, oh, by the way, Pakistan and India are both nuclear powers, and they yeah. have exchanged hostilities frequently over the last several uh, over the last five decades, and you know, even as recently as about a year ago uh, in the Kashmir region. So there there are challenges, and it's almost like gamesmanship. But I. I don't see it changing anytime soon. And there's definitely a, lo a lot of discussion that would take place as to you know, who those new members would be, mm -hmm. whether it would expand in number, et cetera. John, uh, there's a question from one of our students. I, I, I read it, uh, he okay. sent it through the, the chat. You previously, you previously mentioned that China will surpass the United States militarily. Why and in how many years do you consider that this scenario will take place? Well, I, I, I think it will happen economically before it happens militarily. And militarily, mm -hmm. it, it will probably be, uh, my prediction would be, you know, 25 plus years. One of the things that more Western aligned countries, I think, have uh, advantages with is uh, the, uh, our, our innovation and technology. So... The degree to which we can continue to innovate in such things as stealth technology, unmanned aerial vehicle technology, the exploitation of you know, satellites, et cetera, will be to our advantage. Uh, oftentimes, China, uh, they're good, but oftentimes, in order for them to get good, they need to either acquire the information by, uh, by companies agreeing to turn over their proprietary information or they, they take the uh, information and then reverse engineer it. Uh, I haven't seen a, lo a lot of innovation come out of China where they have created something uh, significant themselves. But the, they are very good at producing things uh, relatively cheaply. But I think it will be a decade after the economic point that they are able to surpass us militarily and only at the point that they are able to truly innovate on their own and come up with creative solutions and then put that uh, technology into practice and actually manufacture uh, the, those systems. But they've, they've done things like hypersonic weapons in recent years. They've, they've made significant advances with this and that's a significant game changer, changer in and of itself. Okay, uh, and just since you are in the United States, is there a concern uh, in public debate or in, uh, you know, uh, in circles uh, around uh, uh, the president or uh, in other parts of uh, the establishment of the United States? Is there, a, is there a, a fear what will happen when China will surpass, if China surpasses um, the United States? Uh, right now, no, and I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, on the military side, yes, um, but our military planners are uh, more careerists and have a longer term uh, view of things. Uh, unfortunately, you are, the political structure here in the United States tends to be very short-sighted. 
uh, our elections are every two, four, and six years. And uh, our politicians only look out really at best, best case four years, really mostly only one or two years. So because we know this will happen for a period of time, uh, our politicians are more concerned about getting reelected. And as a result, they're more focused on the shorter term things that can make them look good now rather than taking a longer term approach. So that's, we call it the Achilles heel. Uh, that, that I would say is, is one of our issues because though many citizens of the country, my country, want to hold on to power, uh, but the political side controls things. And as a result, uh, if they don't change the, the narrative or the dialogue and they focus on something else, then that's going to hurt us in the long run because we're, we're not looking long term. And just a, another question, which I think uh, covers a, a topic which is very interesting for our, uh, uh, our Greek students and for myself, of course, as a Greek. You rightly mentioned during your lecture that Greece uh, is, a, is a nation which has a strong navy because we want to defend our islands. Uh, we have uh, uh, a long tradition in uh, sea and so on. As you know, uh, we also have a confrontation with Turkey, which uh, dates back uh, to decades ago. Um, there has been a concern in Greece over the last few years about uh, President Trump's uh, policy vis-a-vis -vis Turkey and how uh, he had a special relationship with uh, President Erdogan. Now, with the change of power in, um, in the United States, there has been um, uh, a change of feelings in a great part of the Greek public opinion. Many people feel that the new president will be, you know, uh, he will see more favorably the situation, uh, in, more favorably for Greece, of course, the situation uh, of Greek-Turkish relations. What do you think? Do you think that the United States will play a more active role in the Eastern Mediterranean? Uh, do you think that they will change somehow their position uh, towards Turkey? Well, I, I, our relationship, uh, you know, presently and my forecast for the future is it will be much stronger with Greece than Turkey. President Erdogan has uh, you know, a questionable human rights record. Um, for, he's also shown, uh, let's say, gr greater uh, diplomatic engagement to, to, to Russia as, as Greece and the United States and the other NATO countries, we are concerned about that. Uh, uh, Turkey has purchased Russian air defense systems, which are not compatible with NATO systems. And oh, by the way, Russia might have backdoors built into those systems uh, that they can turn them off if you know, they wanted to encroach on the alliance. Um, and there, there are also issues with, um, you know, it's, it's persecution with uh, into, it's, it's uh, activity into Iraq and some of this uh, destability there. So I think the relationship with uh, Turkey is going to take uh, a lot more time to mend. Um, and that's kind of just where I see things right now. I, I don't necessarily see things getting much better sooner with regards to our relationship with, with Turkey, but, but time will tell, we, we, we will have to see. And I think you're presenting uh, on April the 12th, correct? Yeah, yeah, so, so we're looking forward, I'm looking forward to hear your perspective on that. Okay, okay. Uh, John, uh, I would like to thank you for uh, um, honoring us with uh, your presence in our uh, in this te teleconference, in this, uh, Distance uh, lecture. Uh, we will be more than happy to have you again in one of our meetings. And I have to say that you inaugurate the whole scheme of cooperation between the University of the oh. Peloponnese and uh, York College of Pennsylvania. You are the first in a series of lectures uh, that will take place in both uh, universities. And um, oh, there, there's a last question from okay. um, Mrs. Juba. I'm sorry, I didn't see it. I'm sorry. But she will have to to write it because I cannot see the question. I can only see. No worries, just uh, if you allow me to intervene. Yeah, and, of, course, uh, of course, of course, of course. Uh, just raise the question really quickly. So dear Mr. Weaver, thank you very much for this insightful presentation and really um, comprehensive. 
So I would like just to, <laughs> to turn, like, let's say the question into another, the, uh, into another direction of the discussion and just refer to the cyberspace. What I mean, like more precisely is like, um, already since 2004, the United Nations uh, have started uh, with the UN group of governmental experts, um, the discussion on um, to examine the impact of the developments uh, and national security and military affairs uh, and on uh, of cyberspace. So in your personal perspective, I would say, and the perspective of the permanent members of the Security Council, uh, how would you consider that the transition, let's say, of these relationships is going to be in the cyberspace, like taking into consideration everything that you have um, referred uh, between specifically, let's say, China and the US. So how would you say that uh, uh, the diplomatic relationships and in general would be transferred in the cyberspace. I hope it was clear. Enough, yeah, Katarina, I, I will attempt to answer that. Um, after I published this book, I actually had another book that came out looking at cybersecurity challenges. Uh, specifically, we looked at uh, Canada and the United States, but cyber is one of these interesting worlds um, where many countries realize that it is what we call an asymmetric uh, tactic, technique, and procedure. That is, cyber is the one thing that all countries pretty much have equality on. And, and what do I mean by that? Is that, you know, whereas the US weapon systems against a China or a Russia, the US weapon systems are better. But in cyber, you know, I can, it's all on the ability of hackers and, it's all on the ability of a country or a private sector organization protecting their networks from intrusions. So my other research showed that though many countries would like to see some type of rules and regulations govern cyber, the other side is we don't really want that because we can take advantage of that against other countries and other countries can take advantage of that against us. So I think that's why we've been slow to see, let's say lots of international legislation or international rules with regards to what we can and cannot do with cyber. And I would submit to you that it's probably from the lens of who has the most to gain and who has the most to lose with regards to just how far forward uh, maybe the UN Security Council might push for some type of binding resolution governing cyber activity. So uh, Katarina, does that help answer your question or, or did I, if I screwed that up, please let me know and I, I can try and come at it from a different angle. No, not at all. It was clear, at least for, for, for me. Thank you very much. Sure. The question was excellent. I think it gave a, a different perspective to, to, to the whole uh, discussion that we had. Uh, I, I just uh, I will just um, take the floor again and thank you one, once more, sure. uh, John, for being so kind to, to be here with us. And uh, as I said before, you inaugurate the whole scheme of cooperation between uh, the York College of Pennsylvania and the University of the, Lepon of the Peloponnese. We are more than happy and we will be more than happy uh, not only to establish this cooperation but also to expand it uh, in the near future and I hope that um, the pandemic will be over sooner or later and yes. thus we will have the opportunity to exchange visits, to see each other in person, to host you in, uh, in, in Greece and uh, to have the great opportunity to have you as a guest speaker uh, in person. Uh, yeah, and, and likewise, I'd like to extend that to you and, and Dr. Petropoulos as well. Okay. okay. Hey, thank you thank very you. much, and I wish thank you, you so all much. the best this evening. Thank you so much, John. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see each other uh, soon. Okay, bye -bye. all the best. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank bye. You.